truth which man knows from experience. He knows more thoroughly than he knows anything else in this world. Or than he can know that same truth in any other way. If what I tell you is true, and you believe it, a benediction is pronounced upon you, as we are told in the very end of the book of John. But the day will come, if it is true, that you yourself will know it from experience, and then you really know it. Then you can be called as a witness. So we are told that truth, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Is that true? And what is this mystery called Jesus Christ? Well, tonight let me share with you what I know from experience. The Gospel of John is in many ways the crown of the Scriptures. It is the simplest and yet the most profound book in the New Testament. It starts off with these stories, and the stories never come to an end. They pass off into conversations, and the conversations fade from a dialogue into a monologue. You find subtle use of words with double meaning. And in each case, those who hear it take the obvious meaning in its context, which is not the meaning intended. There is another meaning, a meaning that is related to the history of redemption. We find this especially in the conversation between Nicodemus and the Lord. Nicodemus came by night. He was a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin. A Pharisee, a brilliant mind, the interpreter of the law, but he recognized in this teaching that which, well, all were expecting. They couldn't quite understand how it could come embodied in a man. For the man was simply a man like all other men. How could it possibly be embodied in a man? So he came by night. And he said, Teacher, I know that you are sent from God. For no one could do these signs. And in John, they're not called miracles. They're all called signs. There are seven signs. And these signs are not done out of compassion, but simply to reveal the divine power. So I have seen in these signs that only one sent by God could manifest its signs and then starts the conversation and it breaks completely from this and he turns to Nicodemus and he said unless you be born anew or the word could be again it never meaning is from above the word is anothen Nicodemus takes it in its first an obvious form. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He replied, Can a man that is old once again enter his mother's womb and be born? And the Lord said to him, You, a teacher of Israel, and you do not know, unless you are born, and he uses the word anathen, which again Nicodemus takes to be, again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But as you read it, you can see that the word from above is intended, not again, as the world teaches reincarnation, has nothing to do with that. There are two modes, one is from below and one is from above. We're all born in this world from below, from the mother's womb in these garments of flesh and blood. But there is another birth, and it comes from above. 
And that breath is out of the skull of the individual, which no one heard of such a birth before. And when that one comes out, it's the same being who is now clothed in this garment of flesh and blood. But it's an entirely different being that's coming out. It is God himself that is being born. It was God who entered death's door, the human skull. It is God who laid down in that grave to share with the individual these visions called the dream of life. It is that God in the end who was actually bring together the one who is called John, called Stan, called by any name, and so weave it within himself that he will actually be that being, and that being will be God. That is the being that is being born from above. Nicodemus could not understand it. He uses another uh, word with its subtle double meaning. And the word is translated wind, or it could be spirit. He said, as the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus cannot understand that. And yet it is from actual experience a wind, and it is the Spirit. When it happens to you, you hear the wind. It's an unearthly wind, fantastic wind. You think it is a storm, a frightful hurricane if you've ever gone through one. I've gone through many at sea, and maybe one or two on the earth, on the land. But I've gone through quite a few hurricanes at sea, and they are disturbing, but it's not, you can't compare it to this sort of wind. It's a wind that takes place within you, and yet at the same time, it is taking place seemingly coming from without. You hear it, and your whole head is vibrating. And yet you feel that the source of it is in the corner. The wind awakens you. That's when you'll be born. When this peculiar wind takes place, he sends his spirit. And the spirit awakens you. And the spirit is the wind. And when you awake, you awake within your own skull. And you know it is a grave. It is a sepulchre. That's where someone, at some moment in time, placed you. And they placed only the dead there. Therefore, you must have been dead. Or they thought you dead. And so here, death was turned into sleep. And the dreamer of this sleep is God, who entered death's door with you. Now, he tells us that this is a gift. What gift? The gift of God is Christ. The gift of Christ is the return of memory. For Christ gives the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And when he comes upon you, he'll bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So the gift of God is his Son. Christ is the Son of God. The gift of the Son is to bring to your remembrance. What remembrance? That you are God. That you are the Father. That's the gift of the Son. It takes the Son to, to bring to your remembrance who you really are. It takes the gift of the Father to give you His Son. For if He doesn't give you His Son, you will never know that you are God the Father. So the conversation goes on, and these are subtle double meanings between the use of the word. The obvious meaning, well, we always take that first, and that's not what is intended. Now he tells us, the Son of Man, and here every scholar misinterprets it. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And they said, that's, now he is foreshadowing the nature of his death on the cross. 
There is no statement in the five books of Moses that it was a cross on which the serpent was nailed. He was lifted up, a fiery serpent lifted up on a rod, a single rod. The obvious meaning is, all right, that's how he's going to die, on a cross. I tell you from experience, that's not what it means. It's actually being lifted up, a fiery serpent, and you are that fiery serpent. Lifted up on the cross of your own spine. And lifted up where? Listen to the words. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. On a cross? No. On the rod. Or lifted up where? Lifted up into heaven. For no one can ascend into heaven, but he who first descends from heaven, the Son of Man. So the Son of Man descended from heaven. And only the Son of Man can ascend into heaven. But who is the Son of Man? The question is asked, who is the Son of Man? They mention all kinds of names, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, some other prophet. But who do you say that I am? He equates the Son of Man with I am. And when you are lifted up, who is lifted up? I am. And you go up like some fiery serpent into your own wonderful skull and it vibrates like thunder. All these truths are so subtly stated that man completely misunderstands it and takes the outer or first meaning and it isn't the first meaning at all. That's the book of John, written by the most profound teacher that we have in scripture. If you mention another one, yes, you could mention Paul and the unnamed one who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. These are the three giants in the New Testament. They're the ones who experienced it and then told it in their own wonderful way. But John is so poetically told. Every verse is like poetry when you read it. And having had the experience, you stand amazed if someone could tell it so beautifully as the unknown author called John wrote it. That grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace is love in action. And John said, God is love. So it's God in action. And grace is an unmerited, unearned gift. If you had earned it, it would be your wages. It could not then be a gift. It's a gift. An unearned gift. And what is the gift? He gave his only son. He gave me his only son to bring to my remembrance the being who I am. For I'm God. You're God. Everyone is God. But not until the gift comes. Now in scripture, we read, He who has seen me has seen the Father. This is all in John. The word to see and to know are the same word in Greek. So he who has seen me knows the Father. If you do not see me, you do not know the Father. But if you encounter me, you cannot help but know the Father. So you have been with me so long, Philip, and you do not know the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. If you see me, you instantly know the Father. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, that is um, the lecture, John, uh, John, the Crown of Scripture. And before we get go any further, let me first give a shout out to Camp Kidded, who does the music for this stream. And he's actually live right now playing Carbo, but please, if you're here live, uh, stick around. Um, I'm going to go watch him after this, though. And they were live with the trio today at 3.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as they will be uh, for quite a while. 
Okay, so that lecture, John, the Crown of Scripture, uh, I'm very glad that Neville uh, mentioned there uh, how he understands the symbolism of John, you know, the, what th that s symbol boils down to, which is love. And John was the brother of James, and James is the judge. And they are brothers to remind us that we are supposed to judge others through the eyes of love, and by doing that, we then know uh, that Christ is alive in us. And I'm also keeping on the stream, you'll see in a little bit, I'm going to keep the little pig down in the bottom. And uh, are you feeding your pig as a little reminder for anyone who knows the pig symbolism, which we discussed in the lecture uh, um, on Thursday. The pig is the symbol of Christ. So when you're feeding your pig, you're imagining lov uh, lovely things. For other people, um, you're thinking lovely thoughts about your world. That's when you are awakening and you're revising every day. That's how you awaken this uh, spirit of Christ in you. Um, another interesting thing that uh, Neville pointed out in that lecture just now, because um, he was talking about the promise when he was talking about grace, which are given through grace. Um, in other words, you, there's no actions you need to take there's no moral stance you need to stand firm in you don't earn the promise uh, you receive it automatically by design uh, by the design that you laid out for yourself um, to experience now Neville said something very interesting there when he talked about whoever has seen um, and in that Greek word see is equivalent to know so when whoever has seen the father knows me um, so whenever you are, or whenever has seen the Son, knows the Father. So whenever you are manifesting something in your life, uh, when you imagine it, and then it happens, um, that is that is Christ being resurrected in your world. So that is actually seeing and knowing the Father on this level of experience. Now when Neville talks about the promise, he's talking about a different level of experience, um, where you're closer to your original identity, and experiencing it um, in a different, much more truly alive form. Here, because everything is dead, um, you're sort of seeing uh, a shadow of it. You're seeing a glimpse of it. However, keep in mind, whenever you manifest something, um, you are witnessing God the Father, who is your true self, in action. Uh, so, And another thing I would like to remind people is that so I do encourage you to tell people in your life how to manifest. And you can put it in whatever terminology you like. You can omit uh, all of the um, references to biblical figures. You can certainly do that. Uh, but keep in mind, no matter how you present it to people, um, they're not always going to be in a state where they're ready to try it uh, or where they're interested or receptive to whatever you're telling them. And certainly, if it's an a-religious person, it's probably not useful to start talking about Jesus Christ. And that is okay. That is the state they're in. The plan is unfolding in them. You know, that it, it, you may be part of it. You may not be part uh, of their unfolding. Um, and it's okay. You don't never try to convince people. I like this. The thing I was thinking today is like when it comes to this stream, I'm mostly interested in finding other people who have already um, been applying the law, who have already read a lot of Neville, and so that we can create a space together to further explore the lectures we haven't read yet or whatever. But also, when it comes to someone who doesn't know the law, who finds this stream, or who only knows a little bit about Neville and is just kind of dabbling into it, um, I am I never have the intention of trying to convince you of anything. Like there's no, I'm not putting forth an argument. I'm not here to make a claim. I'm here to tell you what Neville said, to give my my personal interpretation of it, because I'm I do I have assumed for majority of my life that I'm really good at analysis, especially when it comes to symbolism. So I'm here to break down and contemporize his language for a modern audience. Um, but I'm not really trying to convince you. Like I really. I honestly don't care if you believe Neville or not. Um, like, I'm not 
creating a platform to convince anybody. However, I would very much, I am trying to get people to try it. Like if they have not, and to just examine their thoughts and to really question and experiment. So if, if someone finds this at some point or, you know, wants to bring this up as a point of reference later down the line, um, if you have never really heard of Neville before, um, like, you're not going to, as Neville used to say in all his lectures, you're not, it doesn't cost you any money. You're not losing anything by simply imagining you have what you want already. If anything, you're going to have a tremendous gain as a result. So what is really being harmed um, in you just trying it? Uh, just testing the law and seeing uh, how it works for you, um, how rapidly it works, uh, what your unfolding is like, um, and really just to identify the present state of mind with which you're identified because I think most people who find Neville are, it's, it's when you're, it's, it's, I mean, you're ready for it. That's the reason why it's being presented to you. But like uh, my friend uh, Daphne, who has been on the stream now twice, like her experience was Neville was presented to her many times before she started um, seriously testing. And when she tested, she really approached it from a state of being bold and going all out and seeing, well, how far does this go? How far can I push this? Let me really test this. I want real confirmation here. And if that's the state you're in, that's normal. That's um, totally, I think, common for when people find Neville's teachings or someone who's similar to Neville. And um, the other state that you might be primarily identified with when you find Neville is a victim mentality, is a, I mean, just naturally you're going to be limited to thinking of yourself as your current identity, your current circumstances, and fairly limited in terms of the possibilities uh, for your life. Um, and you're going to have a mindset about how reality operates that's totally different to what Neville is telling you about how reality operates. And that is also totally fine totally normal. If you have discovered Neville at a point of pain in your life, when the seeming or apparent lack of something is causing you an extreme amount of distress, and and, and, and you guys just be in one thing in your life, could be a bunch of things, uh, that's not unusual. That's very common. That's very much on purpose, I believe. It's very much part of the pattern itself. Um, and really, truly, you have to understand that this is this is not me, some guy on the internet telling you this. This is not Neville, some guy who died in the 70s telling you this. This is you giving yourself your own message at a time when you need it and you want it and you're ready to hear it. Um, so if you're one of those people that's ready to hear it, you've been testing, you're ready to keep going, great. I hope you listen to the rest of this lecture and other lectures that I have posted up um here on Twitch and on YouTube and you tune in in the future. Now, if you're someone who's new to this and you somehow found this video or came across it as a reference point later uh, and you really don't know what the hell I'm talking about, uh, that's totally fine too. And you can stop. You, you can just click off of this video right now. I'm not at all wounded by that. That's totally fine. Because when the time is right for you to start testing the law, whether it's me or one a million other people or some other kind of circumstance that brings this back to you, that's always you bringing it up to you. You know, you telling yourself to test these things. Um, and like I said, when someone, when you try to bring this up to someone else in your life and they're so resistant that they're not even willing to test, let them go their way. Don't keep poking and prodding them. When the time is right for them, the time will be right for them. And maybe you'll be part of their unfolding, maybe you won't. However, don't let that fear that the person might, um, you know, might, you know, not want to try or in some way be a little bit rude towards you as a result of what you're telling them. Don't let that possibility prevent you from telling other people because I have so far been very surprised, um, pleasantly surprised. By people that I consciously, as far as I know, assumed 
would not be open to this, would think I'm crazy for believing this, but who then went on to test it and had experiences as a result. Um, and I mean, <laughs> Campbell, who does the music for this channel, is one of them. Because I was hesitant to even say what this stream was about, but I was like, you know, if he's doing music for me, you know, <laughs> that's the point of the stream, like, it's going to have, it's, I've got, I can't keep that a secret. I have to disclose to a collaborator what I'm doing here. And then really as part of me recognizing, well, he is my own self, you know, so the only reason I would even want to ask him for the music is because on some level, the deeper one within me knows he's ready for this message, and he was. Um... So you can be so pleasantly surprised by the people you tell about the law and the things that they're able to do with it so rapidly. You will, And that is such fun to delight yourself in that specific way. In my first interview with Daphne, she talked a lot about, um, a lot about that because she's, she's had the same experiences and she's come to a point of openness about the law and Neville's teachings that... Um, is is really uh, admirable and uh, impressive in a very short amount of time. And that will at some point happen to you. And don't be afraid to tell other people once you reach that point. Okay, that's my rant for today. <laughs> I actually didn't think I was going to do a rant, but hey, sometimes they're just coming out. All right, so let's scoot over to uh, the reading. And I earlier <laughs> forgot to update the, the, the title of the lecture. But it should be updated now. It's all that you behold. I was going to do one called Freedom today. But I decided that I'm going to do that at some point in the future. But if anyone wants a really good comprehensive look at um, how Neville described the world. And how Neville described a lot of the foundational symbolism uh, of, his, of his teaching and his lectures. Freedom is a really great lecture. I highly, highly, highly uh, recommend that lecture. And I will definitely do it uh, sometime soon. Um, I just, you know, the day and the hour, you know, we'll see. In the meantime, uh, I'm also not doing the five lessons today just because this is a long thing that's not even going to matter. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not even going to matter in the YouTube if someone's watching this. But uh, at some point, if someone's watching this in the YouTube, you're going through the archives. By then, five lessons should be up. I should have started on it, but to now, today, April 10th, 2021, I haven't started it just yet because I wanted to reread it first and try to figure out where the segments are um, before I start uh, presenting it, you know, to, for an audience. Okay, all that you behold from um, around this time of year in 1969, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And which is, of course, the, the Blake quote that Neville so was in love with. If you will but enter a state in your imagination and assume its truth, the outer world will respond to your assumption, for it is your shadow forever bearing witness to your inner imaginal activity. And this is a fantastic summary of all the teachings. If you could just understand this one paragraph... You really don't need to read another novel lecture. That's enough. That's everything you need to know about the law right there. Test yourself, and if you prove this to your own satisfaction, you will come to the same conclusion the Apostles did in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts. Then you too will say, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. If the world responds to your imaginal activity, is the world not David doing your will? If the Lord claim that David always does his will and you, by a simple imaginal act, command the outer world to respond, are you not the Lord? When you imagine something, it is as though you struck a chord, and everything in sympathy with that chord uh, responds to bear witness to the activity in you. If this world is a responding chord to what you are imagining, and David is a man after your own heart who will do all your will, is David not the outer world? This is not will as the word uses as the world uses the word. You do not will something to be so, but imagine it and become inwardly convinced that it is so. And if through your persistence the world responds, you have not only found David, you have found the Lord as your own wonderful human imagination. 
So there is a common phrase that I don't know why it got memefied, but it got recently memefied in manifesting communities, and it's Florence Scroville Shin. As far as I know, it's the whole birds before land, and that is simply a phenomenon when when you're imagining for something, similar things start happening, or the thing you want happens to somebody else, and that phenomenon is called birds before land. Um, the reason why that happens is because when you're imagining, you're using the might of God. So, of course, there are going to be other things that are not what you've specifically imagined come up because you've taken the only power and put it on this particular uh, idea. So it must be represented in your world in as many facets as it possibly can. An example of birds before land that people often refer to um, or often talking about and noting as an experience is when they're imagining for a relationship, um, people who, uh, you know, former partners they haven't talked to in years, even though it's at the specific partner they want to be with, will start contacting them. Uh, other people uh, who they um, might consider as partners will start showing interest in them who had prior not shown interest. Uh, you know, random strangers will start hitting on them when prior that was very unusual for them. Uh, so that is, or a friend of theirs, if they've been imagining for marriage or a committed relationship, a friend of theirs uh, who had maybe not even been dating at all will suddenly get married uh, or they'll, or you'll see things um, in media and on the internet that represent, uh, that are very close to what you've imagined. You may even see exact objects uh, represented um, in your exterior world, but not necessarily your manifestation itself. And that happens because you are God. <laughs> it's simple. Um, that's why that happens. And that's what it means. So for anyone who wants to know what this birds before land means, it means you are God the Father. Uh, in Hebrew thought, history consists of all the generations of men and their experiences fused into one grand whole. This concentrated time into which all the generations are fused and from which they spring is called eternity. In Ecclesiastes, we are told that God put eternity into the mind of man, but so that man cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Only in the end will you really know what God has put into your mind. All the generations of men and their experiences, in other words, your imagination, you have access to all of it right now. The Hebrew word olam translated eternity or the world in Ecclesiastes is quite often translated as a youth, stripling young man. These are three titles given David, the son of Jesse. And the word Jesse means any form of the verb to be, i.e. I am. Is that not God's name? When the time of your departure has come, you will see the world of humanity not as a crowd of people, but as a single youth, a stripling, a young man. For eternity is personified as the youth called David. You will know this to, to be true only when you reach the end. Um, David is one of the... So seeing David is usually the third vision of the promise as well. You, you see David. You see David as a singular individual. But here Neville is telling you what David represents, the totality of humanity pressed down into this perfect form. Now listen to these words found in the 20th chapter of John. Peter went to the tomb where he saw the linen clothes lying and the napkin which was on his head, on his head lying now with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. You may wonder why this is stated thus, but I tell you, the linen clothes and the napkin are very significant. Read the story carefully, and you will discover the tomb where he was crucified and buried was called the skull. And Peter, when entering the tomb, saw the linen clothes and the napkin, but could not see the one who was put there. This is not a secular story of a man who died wearing linen clothes with a napkin covering his face, and left the tomb three days later, leaving his clothes and napkin behind? No, scripture is filled with symbolism. The linen clothes symbolize your physical body, the garment you wear here which covers your true identity. This is not a story of one who has died, but of one who has risen from the dead. In ancient times, the word napkin had a far wider range of meaning than it has today. 
We have a dinner napkin, a, co a, a cocktail napkin, and also a sanitary napkin. But this napkin symbolizes the placenta, the afterbirth. The napkin appears separate from the body to tell you that a birth took place. This is the birth John insists is necessary for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew and Luke tell the story. The kingdom of heaven is also is not a place. It's a, it's a state of consciousness that is always within you, that is buried uh, within you. Uh, Matthew and Luke tell the story of the birth as a woman called Mary giving birth to a little child who was different, yet born as we were born. But when you read the story in John, the most profound of all the New Testament writers, you discover where the birth takes place and who Mary really is. Mary is the skull, the womb God entered. Blake said, God himself entered death's door with those who entered, and he laid down in the grave with, uh, he laid down in the grave with them in visions of eternity until they awake and see Jesus and the linen clothes lying there, which the female had woven for them. My mother wove this fleshly garment that I wear, and when I came forth it was from her womb. Then the placenta followed. It had to be discharged, for it has no part of the earth. So it is with the napkin, telling you here that an unusual birth has taken place in the skull, where the drama begins, began and ends. No doubt a number of millions attended last Sunday services and heard that he has risen. Yes, he has risen, and so will you, for God actually became as you are, that you may rise to know yourself to be as he is. Having entered your skull, he now has visions of eternity, visions of wars, famines, and convulsions, were first imagined, or they could not happen. When you imagine a state and find its response coming from without, you have discovered who God is. For all things are made by him. This is so cool that my kickoff rant is so nicely and uh, summarized here in this one little sentence. When you imagine a state and find its response coming from without, you have discovered who God is. For all things are made by him. As he wills, as he wills it so, so it is. But he must have one who will do all of his will. If it takes 500 beings, male and female, to respond to your imaginal act, they will come and seem to you to be the influence through which your desire is made visible. You see, humanity is David, always doing your will. And when your time is fulfilled, the whole of humanity is fused into a single youth and personified as David. Strangely enough, he comes from within you and reveals you as his father. Then, speaking from experience, you will say, I have found David. He has cried unto me, Thou art my Father. And you will know your journey is at its end. It takes all the generations of men and their experiences to bring you to the point of confronting the beauty of these experiences, fused into a single youth known as David. Every child born or woman will eventually know that he is the God who created the universe and willed everything into being. Then he will forgive all, for he will know they were only doing his will. Then everyone summed up will appear to him as David, and he will say, I have found my son David to be a man after my heart who does all my will. Now we come to these words, I, Jesus, and the root and the offspring of David. All right, here he might get into, he might get into this whole David, Jesus um, mystery that um, while it was, something that because Neville having had the experience he had was something that he wanted to talk about I think it's one of these things where you have to experience it as a vision because in language it doesn't necessarily have the same uh, resonance, re resonance and poignance that it does as a vision or as a series of visions um, yes the day will come when you know you created entered and animated humanity so that they could respond to your imaginal acts. And when you have played all the generations of men and had all of their experiences, you will come out of humanity knowing you are its offspring and its root, therefore its father. Yet you come forth from the father as you promised yourself you would. You are told when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your son after you, who will come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. 
Having created humanity, awareness came forth and buried itself in humanity. For a seed must fall into the ground and die before it is made alive. Unless it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. God died to become humanity, which is made of the dust of the earth. His name is I Am. That is the seed which fell into the earth called man, humanity. And every man, be he male or female, says I Am. If I Am is imagining a certain state, and the world responds, be it good, bad, or indifferent, is the response not doing my will? Whether the response comes from a single person or unnumbered people, they are David. For it is he who is always doing the will of I Am. Regardless of your present name, color, or race, you are David when you respond and make visible to me that which I have imagined. And when you find the cause of the response, you find it in yourself. Test yourself and you will discover that your imaginal act was the cause of the response of the world relative to you. Then you will have found the Father and the Son and your journey will be at its end. For you will set yourself free from secondary causes in this world of death. Then your journey will fuse itself into a single youth called David. You will recognize him as he is, just as described in the book of Samuel. You will see eternity, which God buried in your mind, and you will be enhanced by reason of the experience of creating these bodies for the stage, entering them, and playing their various parts. Your presence here tells you, tells me you have played them all, because no one comes unto me save my Father calls them and I and my Father are one. Your consistent attendance and your interest in my words tell me that you are at the end of the play. Having played the part of the well-known and the unknown, the wealthy and the poor, the disgraced and the proud, you have played everything, as it is all contained within you. Every conceivable part is now reality in you, but you need not activate it. You can, however, enter a state, and by the simple act of assumption, Activate that state, and not one power in the world can stop its response. If it takes a dozen or thousands of men and women to respond to your assumption, they will. For humanity is David, a man after your heart who will do all your will. Everyone necessary to fulfill your assumption must and will come to bear witness to that which you are entertaining internally. Now, although Nicodemus was a member, that's cool, he talked about Nicodemus in the uh, lecture we just listened to. Although Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin and knew Hebrew thought concerning history, he could not comprehend the idea of a second birth. It was he who asked, how can a man who is old enter his mother's womb a second time and be born again? Then the answer came, you, a master of Israel, yet you do not know, except you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven called the New Age. This is the drama of one being, expanding himself by first creating humanity, and then limiting himself to his creation. Humanity, although part of the structure of the universe, is dead. God, breathing upon it, possesses the body and spirit, enters and animates it. Now, in a body that is dead, God will go through the horrors of the journey, dreaming you and your experiences into being, until he awakes where he began the dream in Golgotha, his tomb, which is your skull. And when God awakes, you awake. As you emerge from it, you will look back to see that that which you occupy, occupied for 6,000 years. You will see the linen clothes which your mother wove in her womb, and you will leave the napkin which the body expels. Those who come, He's talking a lot about promise visions here, um, but I wonder the 6,000 years, that's got to be a symbol... Uh, you know, what what that would necessarily mean there. Then those who come to bear witness to your birth will see only the discarded body and that which symbolizes your birth from above. Having had the experience, I can tell you, you started your drama in the skull and you will end it there. The drama is all about God, for he created it all. It is God who is playing all the parts of the drama and in the end it is God who extracts himself and rises from his own dead state. That is the resurrection. If you think in terms of one little being called Jesus Christ, you miss the truth completely. For Jesus Christ is your own wonderful human imagination, who is God himself. 
When you imagine a state, God has imagined it. And just as a sound brings a response, your world will respond by playing the part it must play to bring about fulfillment. All you're required to do is remain faithful to the state you entered. Now Paul makes this statement, Remember Jesus Christ descended from David according to my gospel. Having experienced scripture, Paul calls it my gospel. He does not deny the descent of Christ, yet he knows that David was created by him. Having buried himself in David, God died by forgetting himself. Then David appears as memory returns. He extracts himself from that body to discover he is far more luminous than he was before he entered it, far more translucent, greater in power and wisdom than he formerly was. For God is truth, and truth is an ever-expanding illumination. There is no limit to expansion and luminosity. There is only a limit to contraction and opacity. Resurrection is simply rising from the body of death in which you are now encased. And expansion is yours because of your willingness to come into this world of death and overcome it. So don't look for any little napkin on the outside. It is only a symbol of your spiritual birth. When the vision comes upon you, you will know what has happened and why John plays such importance to the napkin. It was John who emphasized birth from above. For only after that kind of birth can fatherhood be discovered. After birth belongs to the body. But after the offspring comes out, the afterbirth is discharged. It is a sign of birth which can be seen. But no one can see you with the mortal eye, for yours is a spiritual birth, spiritual being unseen. They will come and see the remnant you wore, but you they will not see. The day will come when you will experience the symbolism of scripture. Then you and I will once more be in that one body we occupied prior to our descent into these bodies of death. The body of the risen Christ is not something that is finished, but it is in the process of erection. Made up of the redeemed, everyone must rise to the experience, thereby making the body more glorious, more luminous, and far more wonderful than it was prior to our descent into our own creation of death. You did nothing wrong which caused you to enter a body of death called man. You were in the beginning with God and were God. You never were some little worm which coming out of the slime became a little bird and then something else to evolve into man. No, all this is part of the structure of the universe. You were God when you descended into an animated man. And no one can descend into humanity other than a son of God, of which there is a definite number, and it takes all of his sons to form God. The word God is plural. The word is Elohim, which is a compound unity of one made up of others. It takes all the sons of God to make up the I Am. Therefore, there can't be more in this world than there are God's sons. Every child born of woman is alive because the Son of God, his ancestral being, is in him, animating him and putting him through the paces until he detaches himself from that body, which is David, which is his David, his beloved, just as the world is. Someone sitting in a dungeon feeling abused can enter into an image of hate and cause disturbances in the world. Although he is completely unknown and buried in a dungeon, thereby unseen by the world, he can imagine with such intensity that many will be caught in its response. We are forever giving advice when scripture has nothing to say about advice, be it good or bad. Scripture only tells us to go and tell them the good news that you are immortal, as they are. That you created the world and simply extracted yourself from it, just as they can. Don't give them any advice as to what they should or should not do. If your son wants to grow a beard, let him. If he doesn't want to grow up, don't try to give him all of your good advice. Simply leave him alone. And in your own wonderful way, imagine you are free of that state. For the world belongs to you and is always expressing your inner thoughts. See a situation as something on the outside, and you become entangled in its shadows. For everyone who responds to your imaginal act is a shadow. How can a shadow be causative in your world? The moment you give another the power of causation, 
you have transferred to him the power that rightfully belongs to you. Others are only shadows, bearing witness to the activities taking place in you. The world is a mirror, forever reflecting what you are doing within yourself. If you know this, you are set free, and a series of events will unfold within you to reveal the story of salvation. Then you are urged to tell your brothers, to encourage them, for everyone is your brother. Go and say to your brothers, I am ascending unto my Father and your Father, unto my God and your God. In the end, we are one wonderful being. The body is now being slowly erected out of the redeemed, and everyone will be redeemed. If a brother is lost in the world of death, I will leave the ninety and nine to go and search for him. That's interesting. He says there's a definite number. This is this is something unusual I haven't seen in in any other novel lecture I've read where he talks about, um, he defines the number of Elohim. Everyone must be redeemed or the temple will be missing a stone. Therefore, everyone, even the Hitlers, the Stalins, and all the so-called monsters of the world, will be redeemed. For they only respond to the fears and horrible thoughts men set in motion. A friend wrote, saying that although she rarely buys a paper, she bought a Sunday paper a few weeks ago. In it, she read a story of a woman who called herself a great medium. Believing that California was going to drop into the Pacific Ocean, she and her family were moving to Spokane. A few weeks later, a friend came to call and brought a current paper. Glancing through it, she found the story about the same woman who, although only 29 years old, upon arriving in Spokane, she had a heart attack and died. All right, as far as the lady is concerned, California did vanish. She is now in a world just like this. <clears throat> In a section of time best suited for the work yet to be done in her to bring her to the knowledge of who she really is. This frightened little thing died so very young. Yet while she was here, she frightened so many in this state. Friends of my nephew moved to Arizona, not realizing that they were taking their beliefs and fears with them. You can go from here to the ends of the earth. You can make your bed in heaven or in hell. But you will still be aware because God is there. For you can't get away from being God. You may not know that you are, but if you are afraid here, you will be afraid there. Like Job, this lady's fears came upon her. Being afraid, she created her own disaster. But at the end of Job, we were told that it was God who wrought it. For only at the end of the journey do we realize who God really is. Having heard of him with the hearing of the ear, when our eyes behold the truth from experience, we understand. Afraid, I prayed to an external God, and all of my fears came upon me. Then seeing the symbol that reveals my fatherhood, I said, I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye beholds thee. When God extracts himself from this fabulous experience, everything that he was is doubled. That is the story of Job. He did nothing that was wrong. Job simply imagined the wrong things. He blamed the devil, but the devil doesn't exist outside of man. Satan is the doubter. It is he who doubts the reality of your imaginal acts. If you can't believe in the reality of your unseen imaginal act, you may turn to another and believe in him. But you are always imagining. For imagination is God, and imagination imagining is the power of the world. In the beginning you heard, but as your eyes see the result of your inner hearing, you believe. And in the end, everything taken from you will return one hundredfold. Yesterday the world celebrated the resurrection. Yet resurrection and birth from above are two sides of the same coin, and take place the same night. The priesthoods of the world mark the time as the first Sunday after the full moon in Aries. But it does not have to be then. Resurrection can take place at any moment in time. It has taken place and is still taking place, for the temple is being rebuilt on a more glorious scale. For we are the living stones, forming the new Jerusalem. Believe me when I tell you that your own wonderful human imagination is Jesus Christ. Imagination entered death's door, your skull, and is dreaming the world in which you live. It is imagination who will emerge, and when he does, you are Jesus Christ. 
There is never another Christ, and there is only one. When I awake, I am he. When you awake, you are he. And when all awake, we are all he, who together form the one Lord God and creator of it all. Don't envy anyone or condemn anyone. For condemnation is judgment, and judgment is a sympathy of your imagination. With what judgment you judge, you will be judged and fulfilled. You will always find people eager to question what you think of this one or that one. I am quite sure if we all traced our ancestry back far enough, we would find hippies. <laughs> he put hippies on here. Murderers and thieves recorded there. The hippies are next to murderers and thieves. <laughs> In the beginning, no one was born a king. Someone had to feel that position and take it by force. You don't have to go back and change anyone or anything, but envy no one. If someone wants a thousand or a hundred thousand acres, let him have them. If you would like to live in a lovely apartment, claim you do. You may think you can't afford the one you want, but that thought is an imaginal act. I would suggest, instead of thinking you can afford it, to simply sleep in that apartment tonight mentally, accepting the fact that you have all the funds necessary to pay for it. Persist and the world will respond. You will get the money needed to live there. The world does not cause, it only responds to your imaginal acts. For only God acts, and God is in you as your own wonderful human imagination. Now before you judge it, try it. If you do, you cannot fail. And when you prove imagination in the testing, share the good news with your brothers. Tell everyone you meet how the world works. You do not have, have, have to have a proper educational or social background to apply this, apply this principle, and you cannot fail, for an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. When you know what you want, assume you have it. Believe your assumption is true. Look at your world mentally and see your fulfilled desire. Do this, and you are calling forth a response to your thoughts. And in the not distant future, you will find yourself physically occupying the state imagined. Now, after you realize your desire, don't go back to sleep and hold on to this dream that is now solidly real while trying to project a desire through secular means. We are warned against doing this in the parable of the uh, rich fool who said, I have all that it takes more than enough. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones to store my grain and my goods. Then I will take my ease, eat, and be merry. But the Lord said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. Don't hold on to anything on the outside. Hold on only in your imagination. It's something. If something is taken from you, it is because at one time you assumed its loss and for a moment wondered what you would do if it were. You forgot the thought but its message had already been released to fulfill itself. If you want to keep your possessions, you must hold on to them in your imagination and not build barns to house them. That's interesting. This is a very interesting little segment. Um, I was trying to think of a good uh, equivalent, a good practical equivalent uh, to this Fool and Barnes um, example here. I mean, in short, it's simply once you've manifested something, forgetting that your thoughts are creating. Um, like if Neville's brother, after having manifested um, getting the building for the business, had stopped imagining... They wouldn't have been successful. They wouldn't have become Goddard Enterprises. But he applied his imagination all the time in terms of his business endeavors. And, you know, to, to put it practically for a relationship, once you've manifested um, getting married or just them coming back into your life, if you forget that and start um, falling back into your old insecurities or thoughts of them leaving, um, then you will manifest that. If you've 
making that your dominant state and forgetting that your thoughts are creating. Or, you know, if you get the job you want and then you start thinking they're going to fire me, that'll happen. And recently we read a lecture where Neville gave the example of someone who imagined for their friend who was worried about losing their job. Okay. Don't forget, remember the story of the birth is told in John. He does not describe it as Matthew or Luke do, but tells you the birth is essential in order to enter the new age. Then at the very end, he gives you this beautiful symbolism of birth, which comes through death. For it is only through death that one lives. A seed must fall into the ground and die before it is made alive. So God dies, saying, Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. And God arose. I thought this would be a lot more... Uh, I read about half of it, and I was like, this is, should be a mix of law and promise. Uh, there is a lot of law in here, but it's, it is, a lot of it is about the promise, but that's okay. Um, let me switch over to... There's a section I want to reread in a second. Oh, we're reading it right now. Because um, it's another great, uh, really succinct um, advisement definition of the law. When you know what you want, assume you have it. Believe your assumption is true. Look at your world mentally and see your fulfilled desire. Do this, and you are calling forth a response to your thoughts. In the not distant future, you will find yourself physically occupying the state imagined. This is a good lecture. I find this one difficult. Because I still do this. Like, even though I know people are just the states they're in. I mean, in my personal life, there's not any extreme wickedness. But when you look out on the world at large, upon people who do really awful and brutal things, you know, like, you know, actual murderers. It's hard not to condemn that person and see them as a murderer. Right? Like, that's a limit. But then also, you know, I have held people in unlovely states. Uh, there have been times where it was just real, like even after knowing the law, it was just really difficult to see an adjusted version of them, to see a version of them that doesn't have whatever their list of problems is. Like I have encountered that as being problematic. The workaround I found though is that if you can imagine talking to someone else about the person doing better, that helps. That's a great workaround. Uh, let's go back to the All right, so a pretty short one tonight. Um, just because I had less rants than normal, this is a fairly um, typical length uh, lecture. So we're just going to do a short one tonight, mostly because I want to go uh, watch Campbell uh, play. Oh, wait, I went to the wrong one. I must, I want to go watch Campbell play uh, Kerbal right now. I'll put that. Uh, that's what I'm going to do in just a bit. I need to adjust the size of that later. All right. Well, that's all for tonight, I think, because I don't have an additional rant. I'll be back on. Uh, it's a short stream, but that's okay. I will be back on uh, Tuesday uh, to do either another level, level lecture or maybe start in on the five lessons if I have some time before then. I uh, don't think we'll be going back to Walter Lanyon too soon because I really needed to pre-read that entire book. Um, I do feel there were some instances during that book where what was being discussed was a little bit denser than I would like to interpret on the fly. And so in the future, when we're doing someone I'm not familiar with, like Neville, like Neville stuff, like, yeah, there was some weird things in this lecture tonight. I don't know how to explain other than to say 
it's probably a vision. It's probably a component of a vision. And so you understand it once you have the vision. Because a lot of things are that way. Like when Neville talks about the dust, everything here is dust. I didn't understand that until I saw it in a dream. And when I, when I was shown in the dream how it operates, I got it. I totally got it. Um, and I think a lot of the things he talks about are that way. So, yeah. But that's it for tonight, everybody. Uh, thanks for... Um, I mean, there's not... I don't think there's anybody really here in the chat, but if you're watching it back on YouTube, thanks for watching it. And I'm shortly still doing these on twitch.tv slash imaginationsgod. So come see whatever my current schedule is. I may be sticking to it. I may not. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in. And I'm going to play a little bit more of uh, John the Crown of Scripture, um, but probably not too much. All right, so have a great night, and I'll see you again on Tuesday. that dream but it's still a dream and the day will come you have this experience that, that I'm speaking about where you awaken from the dream it's the most peculiar thing when it happened to me here I am in a strange room in a hotel in San Francisco room 725 here I am a normal person Sleeping a normal, living a normal life, went to bed in the same normal manner that I've done year after year, night after night, to find myself waking. And I thought I'm going to awake if I do awake, as I've always done, and I didn't. It was entirely different waking. To awake within a sepulchre, and to know that I am sealed within my own skull. But what an alertness! You've never known such awakeness. So to awaken is to resurrect. That is what resurrection means. Not some little cemetery. You are now buried in the only tomb that you will ever be buried in. Put you in so-called holy ground? No. Forget all that nonsense. Cremate the body is only simply quickening the pace that's going to take place if you put yourself into the ground. For there you slowly decay why the furnace will make it a quick process. But it's the same dust. Only you awake in this world, just like this. And you're restored to life, confronted with all the problems that you have failed. And you fall in love and fall out of love. And you marry and you go through all the battles that you do here. There is no change whatsoever. There is no transforming power in what the world calls death. And you continue the dream that you have here. And then you awake in your own skull. And that is the resurrection. That's when you begin to enter the new age called the kingdom of God. It takes an entirely new body. And that body is a body that you gave up, as told you in Philippians. He gave it up completely when he took upon himself the form of a slave and became obedient unto death even death upon the cross and finding himself in human form he surrendered completely to the form in which he found himself but he gave up all that was his and what was his he was God you were God and you still are God but now you are fulfilling what you pledged yourself to do to complete the dream and not to awaken before the end. So no one's going to awaken you before the end because you are in control. And no power in the world can awaken you before the end. Because then your purpose would be void. And you are going to fulfill your purpose. Go right straight through to the very end. And then return to the being from whom you came. And who is that being? Yourself. 
You are the sender and the sinner. So he who sees me, sees him who sent me. In the office of the saint, I am restricted. In the office of the sender, I am the father. Unlimited power, unlimited wisdom. So, he who sees me, says he, sees the father. And because the same meaning of seeing and knowing is the same word, if you see me, really see me, then you know the father. That's what he's telling you. The day you really see the Son, you know who you are. And you'll see that you are God the Father. This is the story of Scripture. The whole thing is completely given to us in the Old Testament. It's Adam Brady. It's a foreshadowing. It is not altogether conclusive or immediately evident way, but it's there. It's the blueprint, prophetic blueprint. And when it comes into fulfillment in a living way, that's not what man expected. So they rejected it. He came unto his own, and his own rejected him. They received him not. And the world has taken the story and made a peculiar story out of it. Just there's one little being called Jesus 2,000 years ago. That's not it. Jesus Christ is the Father and the Son, and Jesus Christ is in you. The Father and the Son is in you. Or you couldn't even breathe. For that breath is spirit. So the Father is in man. And by entering man, man became a living soul, but not yet a life-giving spirit. When he awakened, he's now a life-giving spirit. So in him was life, and the purpose of the mission of the Son is that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the being in man will one day awaken as the man in whom now he is buried and he is that being. 